What's up, Geminites? It's your boy, Gem Mint. Just got done reading the Ultimate Spider-Man Oversized Hardcovers. Finally knocked out the entire run. Stay tuned. We're going to do a review. And it's probably going to be spoilery. So if you haven't read it yet, come and check this back out when you're done. Stay tuned. All right, man. So very happy to finally get through this run. Uh, overall, I really enjoyed it. I like a lot of the changes that they did with Spider-Man. There were some stories that I didn't really care for, but um, overall, it was really good. It's not the... I was going to say the ultimate Spider-Man run for me. It, it's not my favorite Spider-Man run, but it's one of those that I'm good to have read and got under my belt. As you know, I have already done a review on the Omnibus, which collects these first three oversized hardcovers. And that has to deal with a lot of Spider-Man's origin. It introduces Norman Osborn as the big bad green goblin. And that Norman Osborn created this Oz formula, which he injects himself with. And we come to find out is kind of responsible for uh, creating Spider-Man as well. Uh, this volume introduces the fact that Peter's father, Richard Parker, used to work with um, Eddie Brock's father. And they uh, accidentally created the symbiote suit which was meant to be a cure for cancer. It kind of goes on the person and cures it of all diseases, and then, and then that's it. So we, we got uh, Eddie Brock Jr. as Venom in that storyline, and he does come back here as well. All right, so let's just look through these volumes, too, as we go through. So this is volume one. Uh, I went ahead and read this uh, in, the, in the omnibus. But you see, it starts off right away. We get Norman Osborn. He's doing his experiments on this spider with the Oz formula. And that's what ends up biting Spider-Man, making uh, Peter Parker to make him Spider-Man. We get introduced to already Flash Thompson and Kenny, a.k.a. King Kong. Uh, we get Uncle Ben, Mary Jane. And here's a retelling of the Spider-Man origin. He's learning his powers. So that's kind of how it starts off. It's very uh, Sam Raimi, Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man. And actually, in one of these later volumes, they're in the comics. So is Tobey Maguire. So is um, the other guys from the movies. And they're making a Spider-Man movie. And Spider just based off of the vigilante, you know what I'm saying? And Spider Man's like kind of pissed he's not getting paid for it or anything. So this is Mark Bagley with like uh you know, an updated look for him compared to his nineties stuff. It's more like digital looking. Alright, it goes volume two. More high school stuff. Looks like we get uh, Dr. Octopus introduced here. Gwen Stacy with her, her father, Captain Stacy. So uh, Doc Ock evolves a lot because he ends up being more than just a Spider-Man villain. He ends up being responsible for the clone saga. He ends up working with S.H.I.E.L.D. and stuff. It's kind of crazy. He goes Green Goblin. You know, the Oz formula is basically another ha uh, attempt at making, like, the super soldier serum that made Captain America. So he's fighting Goblin early on. The third volume, obviously, we get introduced to Venom. They really mess up the feng shui with this purple book, too. <laughs> so Peter gets the suit for a little bit as well. They never get the symbol on their chest. Here goes uh, Ben Urich. Oh, he does get the symbol. My bad. Venom doesn't get it. Yeah, so then when Peter has a symbiote, it ends up making him act weird, and then it goes, goes over to Eddie Brock Jr., who uh, Venom's out. 
You get Nick Fury. I love Nick Fury. I always read him like Samuel L. Jackson in my head too. With the kind of cadence and everything. <laughs> When we pick up back on volume four, as you can see by the cover, they start introducing the ultimate X-Men team. So they introduce the X-Men and more importantly, Kitty Pride. Uh, we know her as Shadow Cat. I don't think she goes by Shadow Cat in this book though. She gets introduced, the mutants get introduced, and she becomes like a love interest of Peter, which I didn't really like at first, but it kind of grew on me later on in the story. We also get um, Kingpin beats his uh trial for getting caught murdering somebody on camera so we have electra as his one his hitman or what he likes to call his fist and we get introduced to the black cat as well which uh, is very similar to black cat in the 616 she's basically in love with spider-man and uh she tries to kiss him or whatever no big deal all right so yeah i read those three volumes um around october of last year this is where i picked back up with volume four we have Storm on the front. Who doesn't play a big role at all in here? Electro and Black Cat. Yeah, this was like weird. Like Flash wanted to tell Peter something, but then he never came clean. Mary Jane trying to dress... I don't know, scantily clad, what's the, what's the right word? She's the one who makes his costume, so like, he was run out of spare costumes, he was, you know, they weren't talking, whatever, but then I guess they started dating, maybe in this volume. This was a story about just some mutant who's like a foreign exchange student trying to show off his powers and be cool, but he's blowing shit up and causing all kinds of problems. Mary Jane, I mean, Aunt May is seeing a therapist. She's having a hard time dealing with the death of Uncle Ben. And it seems like everywhere she turns, Spider-Man's around. And she's just wondering what the connection is. She doesn't know her nephew is Spider-Man at this time. But she finds out. Here we have Black Cat. Black Cat is not good, not bad. You know, she's trying to do anything she can to bring down the Kingpin. Even if it means uh, siding with uh, Hammerhead. And going against Spider-Man. And you have... This is the fight with Elektra and Black Cat. That was when Mary Jane ran away. Uh, further on in the volumes, we get Dr. Octopus back. And Dr. Octopus, we find out, actually... Can't, it's not It's not that he necessarily controls his metal arms. He almost becomes like a Magneto where he's able to control metal. So he, he becomes pretty interesting as he's able to create basically Dr. Octopus arms out of any kind of thing laying around, uh, which was pretty cool. Uh, they did do a crossover event here for the uh, Ultimate Sinister Six, and I didn't really like it. I mean, the art was much more mature. But it was kind of jarring for this run to see like this very mature kind of uh, six-part story. And I, I didn't really care for the story, to be honest with you. All right, volume five here. We have Doc Ock on the front. I'm trying to remember what role he plays here because, like I said, it changes pretty drastically. Okay, this is where we get... Does he round up the Sinister Six? He might. So there we have Sandman. And Bagley kind of went back to like his 90s look on a couple of panels, I noticed. It looks more like hand-colored. So we have Sandman. We have Electro. Who else joins this? So you got Cap and Iron Man. Uh, Black Widow. Nick Fury playing basketball. Who's he got in jail? Has he got Norman in there? No, he's got... I guess Otto. So Craven's back. Here's like the little teaser. There will be six. Talking about putting together the Sinister Six. That's uh, Hank Pym going giant, man. Norman hulking out. 
Yeah, I guess it was Norman and Otto put together the Sinister Six as the two brains of it. Then they had Sandman and Electro and I don't know, was it Craven and who else was the other one? I don't really remember. It made me want to read the Ultimates, though. See, that's what I'm talking about, where it looks more like hand-drawn. That's not uh, Bagley, though. Hawkeye's there. See, this is where we find out Doc Ock, he gets his arms back from, like, the other room or whatever. And that's when we find out that whatever it was, the Oz formula or what have you has made him uh, advance to where he can control the arms without them being grafted to his body. As you can see by the cover on here, we get introduced to Carnage. So what happens here is basically Gwen Stacy, her father dies like in the original 616, and Gwen Stacy kind of becomes orphaned and she ends up moving in with Peter Parker. They're good friends. Peter's dating Mary Jane. She becomes part of the family and kind of like fills a void for Aunt May with giving her someone else to take care of. The Carnage symbiote is just a blob, kind of like the Venom symbiote was. And since it's mixed with um, Peter's DNA, it actually thinks it's at first Peter Parker. And that kind of leads into the Clone Saga stuff, right? So the, the blob, you see him trying to become... Uh, a human and he's killing people to suck in their life force and he becomes more solid as that happens and he kills Gwen Stacy and I tell you what even though Gwen Stacy is known for getting killed when it happens in this book it's kind of like oh shit she, they just killed Gwen Stacy so it's kind of crazy how that happens and um, later on she ends up becoming carnage for a little bit too so that, that's kind of weird but it's it's an interesting take all right, so on to volume six. So that's where we get Carnage, and Carnage at first is not doesn't even have a host. Oh, is this worth it? No, the Freaky Friday Wolverine thing I think was already earlier on. Carnage and Superstars. Yeah, so this is where we get Carnage. Kurt Connors basically, he tr Peter trusts him with his blood, and he tries to help Peter. I think Peter was really sick, is what that was, and. This is Ben Riley, this guy here. And this is the death of Gwen, man. Like, oh, right here, yeah. See, the Carnage symbiote, this is after it's already sucked the life force out of a few people. And you can see it's trying to, you know, become a person. And it tries to be Peter because that's whose DNA it's infused with. And as it sucks the life force from Gwen Stacy, it becomes more solid. It's pretty sad, man. And then Aunt May finds out and she gets even more messed up because of that. It messes up Peter a lot. And then uh, what looks like his dad comes back, but it's really just a clone of Peter, aged. Carnage is out here still killing people. And this is when it sucks the life force out and becomes, becomes basically Peter. It has to all do with like being cl clones of Peter and things like that, man. Oh, here is the Freaky Friday Wolverine thing. Let me see. Can I see where Ben, this is like apologizing? Here it is right here. He's basically saying right here like, yo, my bad for these stories. They blame this guy. That yeah, was terrible. This is where Johnny Storm goes, uh, tries to go to his school and... He's outed as Human Torch in like a couple hours. Uh, we get Green Goblin back and I really think it's cool how they introduced Hobgoblin in this universe. Hobgoblin is Harry Osborn and he's basically just hulking out as an orange colored goblin like his father but... Uh, it was against his will. His father was, you know, he's crazy and he's trying to make him better. But he, uh, Harry ends up, you know, he's not a villain or anything. He just hulks out and has to be contained and 
he ends up going against his father. We get introduced to uh, Hammerhead, and he's trying to fill the gap of power with Kingpin not really being on the scene. So we get introduced into Moon Knight, who is his normal uh, multi-personality self, Mark Spector, and a couple of others. And his scenes are pretty cool. We get Daredevil introduced, of course, uh, along with Shang-Chi and Iron Fist. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at Volume 7. So we get Hobgoblin storyline, and we get Warrior. So with Hobgoblin, Harry comes back, and it's almost like Spider-Man 3. Like, he knows who he is. He's kind of pissed at him. We find out Harry was kind of dating Mary Jane before everything went down with his dad. And Mary Jane never told Peter. And that I think that causes him to, like, even break up. And then he hulks out to Hobgoblin. I thought that was a cool origin for Hobgoblin in this kind of else world kind of you know universe this is cool mary jane like showing her on dates with other people but she's still hung up on peter kingpin tries to get spider-man to go after hammerhead kind of saying like look this is a bad guy don't you go after bad guys like you're not doing me a favor you would have got him anyway so kind of puts him in an ethical predicament you got shang chi and Dan, uh, Danny Rand Iron Fist, who becomes a damn rat. Iron Fist. Silver Sable ends up joining in the mix. And Silver Sable is trying to... She's trying to take down Kingpin or something. I don't, I don't even remember, to be honest with you. But more uh, Spider-Man and Kitty Pride. Kitty Pride is you know going to his school now. She's no longer an X-Man. Uh, he's dating her uh, instead of MJ now. He, he, the whole thing with MJ is that he couldn't protect her and she was always getting herself in all kinds of shit. So he, he broke up with her so that she wouldn't be a target or you know she wouldn't be getting herself into danger. But then he immediately starts dating Kitty Pride because she has power. She's She can go intangible. She can't be hurt. So that's why he starts dating her. And they do some superhero team-ups and stuff like that. All right, on to volume eight. So now I remember Silver Sable still has her wild pack and she's still after the Venom symbiote, kind of like those early uh, Venom miniseries. I think it was called Wild Things or whatever. And then here, uh, this is just Kitty Pride putting on a different suit because Kitty Pride, who's a known mutant, can't be gallivanting around with Spider-Man and dating Peter Parker because it would be so obvious. Vulture is actually pretty cool here. He doesn't really have that much of uh, much page time. Get an annual. Looks like it's drawn by someone else. Omega Red. They kind of do Omega Red dirty in this book, man. He's like this evil mutant trying to dis destroy stuff, and then Spider Man easily stops him every time, kind of making him look like a punk. He actually. Comes back later, he's pissed because he can't get jobs anymore. Merc jobs because he's like he's like a joke now. This is like the CEO of Roxin. Peter's starting to wonder why everything's happening surrounding that building, that corporation. Why is everything Roxin? And that storyline doesn't really go anywhere. It kind of just says, hey man, the real enemies are the big evil corporations. We get a Morbius vampire story, which was forgettable. Peter gets bit, but... His radioactive blood is like poison to the vampires. Or not poison, but they don't like it. And this volume is we, we get like kind of this team up with those characters I mentioned before, uh, along with Doctor Strange, who is really Doctor Strange's son. And I, I guess he is the Sorcerer Supreme, but, but he kind of acts really uh, immature. Uh, and we start getting in, introduced into the Clone Saga here. As you can see on the front here, you have like the six-armed Spider-Man. So basically what we have here is Dr. Kirk Connors... Dr. Kirk Connors was trying to help Spider-Man out, took a sample of his blood. He uh, he indirectly creates car the carnage out of that blood. But then also his uh, lab partner, lab assistant, Ben Riley, who is not a clone of Spider-Man, he ends up working with uh, Dr. Octopus and they create clones of Spider-Man. So when Stacy comes back, a twisted kind of Kane version of Peter Parker who is obsessed with trying to save MJ and he injects her with Oz... And turns her into like 
uh, an orange Wendigo. We have um, a female version of Peter Parker who they try to brainwash her to be a girl named Jessica Drew as Spider Woman, but it's really Peter Parker that they changed into a girl, which was uh, which was pretty cool how they did that actually, and that kind of plays a part later on in the run with Human Torch, <laughs> who tries to date her, which is very awkward because in Jessica Drew's mind, she's she has all Peter's memories. So there's a couple of other clones as well. Um, the Clone Saga is pretty dope. They make it more focal around Peter. This whole run is is mostly Peter. They even have um, Scorpion, which is Matt Gargan in the 616. Uh, he's a clone of Peter Parker that they grafted the tail to his spinal cord, which is how he's able to move that tail and everything. And I thought that was a really cool change for the character. On to Volume 9. This is where we start picking up with some of the clone stuff, which was exciting to me, man. I, and I had, I've read it before, but it was kind of like, oh, damn, what are they going to do now? Yeah, so the, the six arm Spider-Man looks kind of like Spider-esque, man Spider-esque on the inside. Scorpion is actually a clone of Peter Parker, like I mentioned, and... They actually played off that really well. I kind of like that reveal. The Jessica Drew Spider-Man. I, I like that touch as well. It it makes more sense how all these people have spider powers. Uh, that they're really just all clones of Peter, you know? Return of Gwen Stacy freaks everyone out. And she stays, man. She, she actually has the Carnage symbiote in her. For whatever reason, man. I kind of forget how that happens. But uh, she she turns into Carnage, and they end up getting the symbiotes out of her, and they kind of call her not really a clone anymore. She's basically like, I don't know, she's a clone. But she's identical to a human in every single way, except for I guess they can't, they never mention anything about a soul or anything, but they're like, yo, from a doctor's perspective, she's human in every way. This is like the deranged Peter Parker that tries to make MJ... Uh, no longer weak or whatever so that they can be together or that she can be protected. Here's Doc Ock using any kind of metal to make arms. So they, they kind of engineered uh, the female version of Peter to have organic webbing out of her fingers. Kind of like how Silk has now, right? Kingpin stuff. So Mark Bagley um, stops drawing Ultimate Spider-Man in this volume, and then it gets picked up by Stuart and Monin, uh, but still written by Bendis. Uh, in this one, you can see we have Iceman, and I, I don't know if that who that fire person is. Oh, <clears throat> Liz Allen gets fire star type powers, and. Um, it starts crossing over a lot with the X-Men stuff. We still have Hobgoblin and Green Goblin in this book. You have um, Carol Danvers is not Captain Marvel, but she is the acting director of S.H.I.E.L.D. We get introduced to Magneto in this book, and he actually is Liz Allen's... Liz Allen's father is the Blob. She never finds out, at least not in these books. And uh, Magneto promised Blob to recruit Liz Allen if she ever becomes a mutant, which she does, and that's how that happens there. This volume 10 was really thin. That's when I realized that they're really just printing this in like arcs. Because it only has like 10 issues in this one. Green Goblin comes back here. Liz Allen finds out she's a mutant. Yes, this is Norman being held hostage by S.H.I.E.L.D. and... What happens is he kind of, he breaks out and then he goes to the news like, hey, I was held against my will with no trial, with no uh, Miranda rights or anything like that. Like, what's going on over here? I just want my son. And he ends up just hulking out and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Harry who, who ends up going against him. Here's the Liz Allen stuff with Magneto trying to kind of recruit her to the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. 
Parker is working at the Daily Bugle this whole time, and here's like the second time he goes up against Omega Red. All right, so the last issue here has the Shocker, who has these guns instead of these gauntlets. It's kind of one of those things where Spider-Man never took him seriously as a villain, and he snaps, and he really gets him kind of in a tight spot, man, and gets him chained up. There's nothing he could do, and I forget who comes to save the day for Spider-Man. It looks like it's probably Kitty Pride. I don't really remember. This volume 11, it's really like the last volume because what happens here is we have this catastrophic event in New York City. Uh, they call it the wave, I think. Yeah, they call it the wave. And basically the tidal wave destroys the city. They say Magneto's behind it. But we never really get much of what happened in this book, which is kind of unfortunate. It must happen in Ultimate X-Men. But basically, um, issue 133 is where this volume of Ultimate Spider-Man ends. And Spider-Man gets, uh, well, Venom comes back. Spider-Man gets redemption finally because throughout this whole series, he's labeled as a menace. And J. Jonah Jameson witnesses, uh, witnesses Spider-Man saving people and has this epiphany like, damn, I've been wrong the whole time about Spider-Man. So once it's all said and done, millions of people have died. J. Jonah Jameson writes a confessional, which is a eulogy for Spider-Man because he's seemingly dead at the end of this book. So then Spider-Man is a hero. Volume 11, which is like pretty much the last volume, shows Spider-Man underwater because of the whole wave, which was, I guess, caused by Magneto, but that doesn't happen in these books. Venom returns. Spider-Man actually gets the symbiote again, and he Venoms out himself. So we get a lot of Eddie Brock. He's sitting on a park bench, like Forrest Gump style, talking to mad people and uh, kind of telling them, hey, I know who Spider-Man is. Uh, I'm Venom. And I don't know, he's he's actually uh, draining their life force, kind of like the symbiote is eating them because the symbiote's hungry, wants to feed. We get this beetle character, which I guess we find out is from Latveria. That's Spider-Man having to go up against the Ultimates. Goblin comes back and he breaks out uh, the Triskelion and Gwen just walks out. That's when she kind of just leaves there. And she has the symbiote still in her, actually. She so shows up here and you see she's got the carnage face going. But they end up getting the symbiote off of her and, like I said, giving, giving her a clean bill of health. The beetle actually does capture the symbiote. And I don't think we see what happens after that. With the symbiote, at least. So here, basically, right before the wave, the feds bring in Aunt May. They kind of are figuring out that um, Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And then, like, the big crash, boom, bang happens. Daredevil's dead. What was kind of cool about this universe is that since it was, like, an Elseworld story, they were able to do stuff like this that had, like, lasting consequences, like... They never, like, fixed everything that happened here. Like, it all happened, and boom, that's it. Then you get these uh, Ultimatum, Spider-Man, Requiem 1 and 2, which is kind of like Spider-Man's dead, right? Because that's what the significance of this is. Every, you know, they come back to Queens. You have Gwen, you have Kitty, you have MJ, and then, boom, they only found Spider-Man's mask. So they assume that he's dead. And this is um, J. Jonah having an epiphany looking up stories that he refused to publish from Ben Urich that painted Spider-Man as a hero. And then it shows like a couple flashback things like Mary Jane interviewing Tony Stark for, for her school and things like that. So, I mean, that's how this ends, really. That's kind of how this story, like, this run ends with like Spider-Man being dead. We get this last volume, which they rename it from Ultimate Spider-Man to Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. And you get a 14-issue book here that picks up after the aftermath. But it's a really weird uh, direction, man. It, it, it changes uh, artists to David LaFuente and uh, Takashi Miyazawa. 
and it becomes very cartoony looking. All of a sudden, Peter's dating Gwen Stacy, and we're like, what the hell? He was dating Mary Jane, and he lives with Gwen Stacy still, and then we find out that Mary Jane broke up with him, but we don't know why. And he's living with now Gwen Stacy, then Johnny Storm comes back out of nowhere, moves in, then Iceman, Bobby Drake moves in, and it basically feels like Spider-Man and his amazing friends during this volume. We do get um, Mysterio return. He was teased a, a couple times at the end of the first volume, and he straight up just kills Kingpin right out the gate. Boom, zaps him through the penthouse uh, windows like Watchmen style kills kingpin and mysterio causes uh, some havoc uh and it ends with a chameleon and his sister chameleon run which really messes up spider-man because he captures spider-man and jay jonah he keeps him prisoner and he robs and uh does bad things posing as spider-man and that's how it ends it doesn't really feel like a complete run with these 12 books i mean really the first 11 books feel like more of a complete run and then you get this last volume which kind of feels a little bit off so i'm interested to see where this goes leading into the death of ultimate spider-man omnibus actually let's look at it right here Okay, so it does pick up. This is issues 1 through 14, Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. Then this has Ultimate Comics Spider-Man number 15. And then it goes back to the original numbering and does 150 through 160. And uh, then we get Ultimate Comics Avengers vs. New Ultimates 1 through 6. And then Ultimate Comics Fallout 1 through 6. So for whatever reason, after Requiem, they did another volume of Spider-Man called Ultimate Comics Spider-Man. And I guess it's because Ultimate Spider-Man was the first one, then they made it a whole universe, so then this title kind of coincides with the fact that Ultimate Comics is a thing. And you can see right away, this has a very like cartoony kind of style art, where Spider-Man has that circular head, and almost looks like a little bit like manga-ish. Uh, you know, the, the events of the wave have happened, but Spider-Man's back right away. They don't really kind of explain. Oh, they do explain where he was. My bad. They show the Ultimates pulling him, pulling him up under wreckage. We've got this new costume vigilante in town who we find out later on is Kitty Pride. And like again, right away, um, Peter's dating Gwen, and we're, we don't know why. Here goes Mysterio straight blasting Kingpin out to his death. That was pretty cool. A little death of Kingpin action, which I was sad to see. Some Mysterio holograms. Johnny Storm saying uh, that you know Aunt May's going to take him in. So that's when we get the start of Superhero House. <laughs> and eventually, you know, I guess what happened off book or, you know, probably in Ultimate X-Men is that it became illegal to be a mutant. So they, they try to kick Kitty Pride out of school. Bobby Drake has nowhere to go. He moves in with Peter as well. And then you have, like I said, Spider-Man and, and his amazing friends. Feds try to come take Kitty. Kong is like her ex. And then he, uh, he stands up for her and they escape together and get back together. Here goes the chameleon stuff. So the way that this volume ends is, okay, boom, chameleon and his sister get caught. So I, I assume they're going to let the world know that it wasn't Spider-Man robbing banks and all doing all that kind of stuff and like messing up Peter's uh, personal life because he's making out with, or he tries to kiss Mary Jane even though he's with Gwen, da, 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 high school drama and all that. Alright guys, so that is the Ultimate Comics Spider-Man Oversized Hardcover read-through. I enjoyed it overall. There were some things I didn't like. There were some things like this last volume which kind of felt a little jarring uh, as well as some of the other crossovers with other writers and artists but overall glad to have read it shout out to my man terrence cassell for uh, sending these books we're gonna go ahead and send them right back to you i think a lot of people like this run depending on kind of when you got into comics right if this was like your first spider-man run this is your nostalgia read and uh i get that uh, I still have mine, which is like the Bagley Maximum Carnage era. But let me know what you guys think about Ultimate Spider-Man in the comments below. Hit the like button on the way out. And make sure to subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Make sure to come join the Geminites Facebook group. We're over 2,000 members strong and growing on there. And you guys stay minty fresh. Peace.